And now from Times Square, crossroads of the World Wide Web, and sponsored in part by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, it's the Wrestling Observer Live with Dave Meltzer. How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. We're going to have Brian Alvarez up here hopefully momentarily. Is Brian here? Is it Brian up yet? No. Brian is not up yet. Okay, well, hopefully he will be up momentarily. And uh, we'll probably have a couple of, uh, we may have a couple of surprise guests coming in. Uh, during the next two hours. Bobby Heenan will be up in about a half an hour, and we'll be taking your phone calls as well as your emails. You can call us at 1-877-392-3299. We're actually, we actually live from Atlantic City. Brian's up. Brian, how are you? Can you hear me now? I hear you fine. What's okay. going on? I'm doing pretty good. That's good. I'm just actually looking at uh, the email that you sent. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, how much SmackDown did you get to watch? I actually watched the whole thing. Okay. And uh, what's, uh, what's your thoughts on the show? Um, I think overall it's one of those deals where they really they really did a good job with Kurt Angle on this particular show, and it's like great. This is a perfect day to do it. I shouldn't even complain because they did it, but it's like why couldn't you have done this at the very beginning? He came out, he cut a promo, he ran down Rock. He was pretty much a badass the whole night. He didn't act like an idiot. He wasn't treated like an idiot in the tag match for the most part. Uh, Kane and Undertaker didn't sell. I don't think one thing during the entire match, but that's a totally different. And he ended up putting Rock through a table and got the pinfall. It was a no DQ match in the main event, so he got the big win over Rock before the pay per view. And um, it's kind of weird because during his promo, he's talking about how you know everybody expects it's going to be Steve Austin and The Rock at WrestleMania, and I'm going to prove them wrong. And then I read the Ross report, and Ross says everybody expects it to be uh, Steve Austin and The Rock at the pay per view, but stranger things have happened. Who knows what will happen? And I was thinking, I hope they don't change this. I hope they don't swerve us for well, some reason. Well, well ever, since everyone's talking about it, I think that they feel they need to acknowledge it. If they change it, that would be so silly. You know, one thing, I got a question. What, what do you think about this? Because, okay, Angle, I mean, I understand that The Rock is almost for sure going to be beating Angle for the title on Sunday. If not, if not, they'll do it on Monday or, you know, quick enough. And they really ought to do it on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think this is one of those things where they should, you know, swerve everyone on Sunday just to do it on Monday to build up a rating. Then again, I think if they do anything, they'll do that. I kind of don't think. Uh, in fact, I don't think that they should. But if they do, what, I can do doing, doing that. Yeah, you know, I could. You know, Raw's ratings are a little bit flat. I, you know, um, but I think that I don't know. I don't even know that Rock should have been pinned last night. I mean, Angle definitely needed a big win, especially since he's going to lose the title. And I can understand. You know, the old the guy who's about to win the championships, you know, can lose a match because he's going to win the world title. But I almost think that, uh, I don't know, Austin and, and then again, we'll see how what happens with Austin and, uh, and Triple H. And also, the other thing is, is what happens with Triple H as it pertains to the main event. Because, uh, there's an awful lot of people who think that he's going to get in that main event somehow. Mm hmm. I'm and one of them. Do you, you think it's going to end up being a three way? I kind of do. I mean, what else, what else have they really got going for Hunter? What can they set up in one month? Well, they can always do something with Angle. Although I do know that Angle and Benoit want to work with each other at WrestleMania, just because neither of them have anyone think that they have anyone else to work with. Mm -hmm. And of course, we got Benoit in a four-way, and uh, Benoit, X Pac, Eddie Guerrero, and Chris Jericho, which is four good workers. Yeah, it's just tag match really wasn't anything special, and it was um, really they did Benoit and Eddie versus Jericho and X Pac, and. Um, X-Pac wouldn't tag out to Jericho, and then at the end, Jericho went for the lion's stall, and X-Pac kicked him in the face, and then Benoit put on the, the cross face. And I mean, it was it was all right, but it wasn't like something you'd watch and go, oh, my God, i got to buy this pay-per-view to see these four guys have a match. What about the stuff with Stephanie and Trish? Was it, I mean, I, I read it all. Obviously, I didn't get a chance to watch the show. <laughs> I, I don't know if I just live in a very um, urban area, but there was something about this skit where they're backstage in a parking garage at this arena, and there's a bale of hay back there, and even more importantly, what's, what's, what's what city were they, back there. What city were they in on Tuesday? I don't remember. know. It had to be somewhere rural, because there are horses in well, the Well, Kemper, Kemper Arena, Kansas City. Yeah. That's right, it was a Kemper Arena. Yeah. But, I mean, they did the whole deal where Stephanie goes back there, and it turns out Trish wasn't in the limo at all, and she jumps her and throws her into manure or whatever, and pours slop on her. They never even really said what it was, but Stephanie was just crying hysterically, and it was just one of those weird things where, here's this girl crying hysterically, you'd think that, is she going to be the baby face here? This is Stephanie McMahon, and we talked about it before, she's the writer, so 
obviously she wants to be cheered during that match, and she probably will be. But oh, she will be for sure. Now, didn't, didn't they set it up with something like uh, that? There was like a bear in town or something. I forget. There, there was there was a storyline set up for that. Okay, well, I'm glad that it was because all I saw were these horses back there, and I was just going, "What the hell's going on? Where are they at?" It looks so. It was kind of goofy. I mean, it was an angle. Nothing. I didn't think overall that the show was. I think what they did well was they built up the pay per view pretty well. But um, I mean, as far as the wrestling, it wasn't really anything too spectacular. Main event wasn't real great. The one thing though. Um, when, when reading the uh, spoiler report for the SmackDown show, they were talking about the uh, first match with Rikishi and Jeff Hardy. And, I mean, everybody who wrote a report that was there live was talking about, man, Matt came down and saved Lita and just totally ignored his brother, which he did, but they didn't really play it off like that on TV. It was just like, you know, Jeff got squashed, and then uh, Rikishi went after Lita, and Matt ran down to make the save. So I'm sure that's where they're going. They're going to split him up over, you know, the girl. But as far as playing it up big time on the show they really didn't do that yeah well i'm gonna get to judge tonight oh everything nice. came through yeah it's uh, about an hour and a half ago it's just, it's it's <laughs> it was a funny day i mean between the between having to get an ekg to judge which turned out to be like a big comedy thing here um you know everyone's like laughing at me because i have to run and get an ekg and then uh the blood test which i took a couple days ago which was a trip in and of itself uh, and they were supposed to fax the uh, results here, which, in fact, they did many times today, but the fax machine was busy. So then when I called the hospital at uh, 3.30 our time, um, they said, I said, you know, you need to fax this thing. It's kind of like the time time pressing thing. And uh, they were like, we've been faxing it all day, and we're not going to do it again. <laughs> nice. I'd be like that. They, well, so they've been you. sending it, but it's but it's been it's been busy. Cause remember when we were talking earlier today, um, and that like I've been calling them to send to fax this thing, and it never happens. And they said we've tried, we've tried, we've tried, and we're not going to do it again. So what ended up happening? So actually, my girlfriend saved the day because she, in a panic, had earlier called them and told them to fax them the thing, which they did. So she ended up faxing it here, and um, everything anyway, everything's fine. The so funny thing is. I mean, up here in Washington, if you want to be a referee, you have to get a physical and everything just like a wrestler. If you want to be a manager... Well, referees got to move around the ring. I can understand Yeah, manager's that. the same thing because they might get involved, but... Um, yeah, because they're going to take bumps. Uh, judge. Are they afraid you're going to jump the rail? I mean, I could see the eye test. And, and I, I was glad to take it because if I was blind, I really think I shouldn't be a judge. But um, I don't know about the EKG. Do they make well, you tan and shave, too? Um, well, actually, it was really good that I did shave down, and I'll tell you why. Because when they put all those little uh, electrodes on you, if you've got like a hairy chest, it hurts like hell when they rip them off. And if you don't, it doesn't hurt at all. I've never even had an EKG or anything really? like that. No, most I've ever had, had a blood EKG. test in the physical. They don't. They don't make you take an EKG. They no. should. Look at Gary Albright. I mean, that's 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 why I say that. If it wasn't for Gary Albright, I'd probably maybe. I mean, I think they. Should, I mean, I think they should make you take everything. I just have never had to, even yeah. in Oregon. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that, the, the, you know, that was that was where I kind of changed my mind because, you know, he, here's this guy. What exactly does an EKG do? What are they just testing just, for? T it tests if your if your heart's being regular, basically. So that, I mean, like a blood pressure test. It's well, I do the blood pressure too. Yeah. Okay. But that's you know that's a, that's a, but um no it, I think with the and I was, was the EKG would would it if it if it got uh, I don't know that the I'm just trying to think like what. Like when you have like uh, hardening of the arteries, you know atherosclerosis, which is what Gary Albright had, that and you know he wasn't tested by either All Japan or you know Pennsylvania or anything like that. Wouldn't something like that show up in like a blood pressure test though? If you're, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Because I definitely have to take that. Yeah. And a little knee to the uh, the mallet to the knee. They didn't make me do that one. No. No. Check the ears. That should be mallets. important though for a judge. Check your reflexes. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Why did you even say that? I just thought it might be important. Oh, we got Don Fry here. Come on in, Don. Only the best. Don, this is uh, Don Fry, of course, uh, top foreigner right now for New Japan Pro Wrestling, and of course, former UFC champion. Uh, Don, what, how was the transition of uh, going to UFC into New Japanese Pro Wrestling for you? And uh, you thought about American Pro Wrestling, and what's the status of that? Yeah, the transition is really simple. Uh, you know. I've Beat people's ass here, so I went over there and beat people's ass. No problem. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm considering, I'm looking at going to the WWF, possibly, if uh, not return to the UFC. Really? So you, so you're, you're, you want to come back? 
Oh, I definitely want to come back. I got down in the octagon today and got a little chubby when I was walking around in there. It was really good. <laughs> now, you're, you're a lot bigger than when you were in uh, UFC before. What, what, about 25, 30 pounds? Yeah, exactly. I'm yeah. weighing about uh, 230 right now. I went down 10 pounds due to an injury. So I was, I was looking pretty damn good for a while. Yeah. Now, one other thing with, with, with you in Japan, because, you know, when I was seen, seen taped, and I, obviously this is something you go out to do. Every tour, you have a different look. Like, you'll have the long hair, then you'll have the short hair. Yeah. You know, shaved chest, long tights, short tights. Is that one of those things that you're just doing to keep yourself fresh? Or? Yeah, I, you know, start out with uh, short hair and then put a weave in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a uh, long hair and a goatee, and they called me up and told me to clean up my act. And, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> chased me away from the bars and all that. So, it was pretty bad. Now, how, how do you like, uh, you know, you're in Japan like several months, it seems like several months out of the year now. How do you like, it's almost like a second home type of a thing. Uh, definitely second home. Um, all the maids know me by name. <laughs> <laughs> Bartenders definitely know me by name. Um, spend half my income over there. <laughs> I still do a lot of training in Minnesota. Do you train in Minnesota still? With Brad? Uh, I get up there in Minnesota as often as I can. I love Brad. He's a great guy. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. Did you train at all with Brock Lesnar? Did you guys ever... No, he never got a chance to roll around because I had an injury uh, when I was up there. And so there was not smart growing in the ring with Brock if you're injured. <laughs> now, what's... Uh... You know, right now, there's, there's you and Brian Johnston. Has there been any talk of, I mean, we know that like a lot of the guys, Mark Coleman, Mark Kerr, did the, that Tokyo Dome show that you also, or Osaka Dome, I Osaka, should say. Yeah. Osaka, that you did. What was, uh, I mean, have there any thoughts of bringing some of those guys in? And how was, how did you think the Osaka Dome show went? Because going in, I thought that that was going to be a really scary show in that a lot of guys who'd never done pro wrestling were doing it, but it actually turned out almost like a miracle in some ways, some of those matches. Yeah. Well, they all pattern their style after myself, you know, so they look great. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, my my match was the best one on the cards. So. <laughs> what we, who's your favorite guy to wrestle with there? Um, do you have myself. Any, no, I mean, I mean, wrestle against. Ah, you wrestle against. Probably be Muda or Chono. Really? Uh, yeah, they're both best workers in the business over there. Really, more and, than more than Nagata. Ah, uh, Yuji's a great worker. I tell you, I love working with Yuji because um, he always makes you look good. Yeah. And uh, like those are definitely top three. Now, how was uh, how was the the match you had? I guess it was Sunday. You just got back from uh, the yeah. the pay per view match. Yeah, I just got back from that with that Chono was, and everything. Yeah, I fought Chono in that. That was a pretty good match. Um, kind of anticlimactic finish, but it's pretty much my fault. I pulled a groin a couple weeks ago, so I was bruised from my waist all the way down to my calf, and so they take me up you know, from belly button to ankle and put me out there and did a great. You know, Chono had give me a great match. Do you ever have, like, communication problems with the uh, Japanese? No. No, nah, they provide an interpreter. Um, <laughs> as long as you can speak beer, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you did the angle with Chono uh, to, to set up the pay-per-view match, um, I noticed that that was a tough match because you, you, you seemed like you were really hurting as far as I just I just noticed on the, the limping and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I pulled my groin and maybe my hamstring too, so <laughs> it was kind of rough getting it around. Now you, uh, about uh, I don't know how many months ago or a year ago or so, uh, you had said a lot of things and you'd wanted a match with Ken Shamrock, and then to everyone's surprise, you did the tag team. Although you did the thing afterwards, what, what's your thoughts as far as uh, Ken Shamrock? I mean, did it did it uh, change things, or did you just like, do the tag team because Anoki asked you, or what was that? I did the uh, tag team as a favor to Inoki, and I'll respect for him. Yeah, uh, Shamrock and I didn't say two words to each other. I have no use for him, and he definitely has no use for me. Do you think you're going to do a match with him at some point? I hope so. Yeah. I right. hope so. I mean, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm gearing up. <laughs> really? Inoki didn't talk to you about that, though, as far as why he did the angle afterwards? I mean, did they, like, like with the, with the thing that you did after the match, was that, like, to set up a match in Japan, or was that just you guys... Just ended up doing it to do it. <laughs> Figuring that you're going to set up a match somehow, you're going to do, your, do it on your own anyway. Ah, uh, well, that was. Oh, how do I explain that? <laughs> yeah, that was more. That was more uh, for a future event. Yeah, I mean, is it is there like any kind of a date set for anything like a dome show or? No, I'm I'm open. No, give me something as soon as possible. You know. Now, now, what does New Japan think as far as, like, you talked about wanting to go back to UFC? Are they for it, against it? Are you... I haven't told anybody about it. Oh, okay. No. no it's just like telling them, hey, I'm going to go negotiate with Vince McMahon also. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not wise. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, as far as, like, uh, WWF and everything like that, um, is there any reason you want to, you know, you want to go there? You want to kind of, like, test yourself against uh, the American style now? Uh 
the main reasons for the money situation. Sure. Uh, there's good money over in Japan, but we don't get residuals or money from merchandise like they do over here. Mm -hmm. We've got, we got a question here. It's... Um yeah, it's actually it's actually big. Basically, how many years do you think you have as far as like you know? There's a timeline as far as coming back to yeah. mixed martial arts. You don't want to do it when you're 40. I don't know. I don't think. No, no. So you what are you about 30, 33 ish? Yeah, 33. Yeah. 29. <laughs> <laughs> For a second time. So, so how many, I mean, what, do you have kind of a thing where, because like Ken Shamrock was actually like this, you know, it got to be where I guess he was 35, 36, and it was like, if, if he didn't, you know, he left the WWF, yeah. and then he was doing pretty well there, and the idea was, he knew if he didn't do it now, if he waited two more years, he would be too old to do it. Do you kind of feel like, you know, if you don't do it now, if you wait till you're 36 or something, that's going to be hard to go back? Well, all I wanted to come back for is a fight of Shamrock, either uh, Ken or Frank. I don't care. <laughs> How about Bob? <laughs> I'll fight Bob. Oh, I think he's the craftier of the three. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there any uh, any particular matches aside from? Obviously, you're going to probably have a return match with Chono, perhaps Osaka Dome. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think the Chono's injured right now, so he might take a couple, three months off. Um, he's got a real bad neck. Mm. Yeah, he, he should have got that taken care of a couple of years ago. Well, one of, one of the things with, with everyone in Japan, you know, like Mudo with the knees and everything, you know, they're great workers and they're really, they, by the time they're in their late 30s, they're mid 30s even, they're really banged yeah, up. It's a yeah. very tough style. I yeah. mean, how, how physically compare this to, uh, to when you were fighting in the UFC? You know, you, you had some real awards in the UFC, but then, you know, the New Japan's a different kind of wars. Yeah, I had a couple injuries in the UFC, and uh, then I've had more injuries in New Japan. Yeah, it's definitely tougher because uh, you do it more often, and it's a lot stiffer style than what we have over in the States. Now, looking back, one of uh, the most famous matches you had in UFC, which is, I think I think is the only loss that you ever had in the UFC, was was the Coleman match. Looking back, do you think you know you you came in and you had and I'm trying to remember that night. You had two pretty tough fights. You had uh, Brian Johnston, and I forget what the other one was. And Coleman did not have as tough a fight, so you were you were coming in more tired than him. And eventually, uh, do you think that if, if you had started out fresh, and he would have started out fresh without the two fights with each with each of you, do you think that that, that would have turned out differently? Oh, definitely. I think it would have turned out differently. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think so. Um, but that, that was my own fault. You know, Like everybody, we all get cocky, and we don't train as hard. And I didn't put as much effort into that fight like I should have, you know, in, into the training and preparation for that. So I paid for it in the long run. And, uh, you know, this is God's way of whacking in the back of the head and telling you, just, you know, keep track together, boy. Now, what was your thoughts as far as, um, and physically, how, how were you after the, um, the ultimate ultimate when you beat Tank Abbott? You had a broken hand early on, came back, um, you got, you got whacked a couple times early, and then you choked him out in about a minute. It's about the most exciting one-minute fight, I think, in UFC history. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty exciting. I'm glad it was over here. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the excitement I could stand for that night. <laughs> I mean, did you get a broken hand out of that? Or? Yeah, I broke my hand out of that, and then uh, they pinned it and pulled the pins out three weeks later, probably prematurely, because I broke it like a year to the day um, after that, and then they put a plate in there and five screws and all that good stuff. Now, how... How does that affect? How would that affect you coming back, or would it at all? Well, I'd ask them if they put a steel stud in that. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor wouldn't go for it. <laughs> so, but I don't know. We'll have to see how it will affect me. I mean, I've hit a couple people on the streets, and it hasn't been yet. So. <laughs> hey, you know that's, that reminds me. Tell us the story about Ernest Miller and uh, you. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. I went down there to interview with WCW, and. Um, uh, during the interview, I guess I made uh, Eric Bischoff mad, and uh, he starts talking about Ernest Miller, and he's building this guy up like he's 10 foot tall and bulletproof. You know, phone rings. He says, "Oh yeah, come on in." He says he's outside and he's going to come in right now. Guy walks in, he's no bigger than me, so that that from the beginning doesn't impress me. And uh, so we all go to lunch, and we're sitting in a booth, and Bischoff is between us, and Ernest starts telling me about uh, how there's never been any real kick kickers in the UFC. And I said, well, what are you talking about? You know, Marie Smith was in there. No, I beat Marie Smith. And he never even did a full contact fight as far <laughs> as I know. He'd never been hit. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, Marie Smith was, you know, several times world champion. He's a legitimate deal. No, I beat Marie Smith. I'd kick his ass. I'd kick anybody's ass. <laughs> I said, well, you know, maybe so, but you don't understand these guys are professionals will take you down. You know, you might get one or two kicks in, and they'll take you down submit you. Nope. 
nobody will take me down, I'll kick all their asses. So no, you really don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> These guys will take you down and they will cement you. No, no, nobody can beat me, I kick all their asses. <laughs> I got tired of it and I leaned over, you know, on top of Eric. I put my finger in uh, Ernest's face and said, listen, God damn it, I guarantee you one thing, you never kick my ass. And uh, that was pretty much the end of my career at WCW. <laughs> <laughs> they, they sent me a bill for the room and everything. <laughs> now what's, how's, how's Brian Johnson doing over there? Brian's doing good. You know, Brian's good talent. Mm -hmm. you know, big, big, strong monster. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's athletic, probably one of the most athletic guys I've ever seen. How's, how, how have your matches been with Norton? Because I think you, what have you have wrestled him once or twice, maybe in a tag a couple times? Yeah, I've wrestled Norton a couple times um, in solo matches, and Norton's fun to work with. You know, he's got a lot of experience, and it makes you look good. Mm -hmm. We are live in Atlantic City, where in just a couple of hours, uh, the UFC uh, battle on the boardwalk. UFC 30. Actually, it's probably about the 34th or so pay-per-view, but a couple of them, they didn't use numbers, so this is number 30. And uh, we actually have... Uh, Probably the most decorated star in the history of the UFC. Uh, and he's, I don't know where he is, but we also have Frank Shamrock sitting in front of us. <laughs> and, uh, Usually the dogs announce me, but they weren't here. I <laughs> tried to do my own bark, yeah. <laughs> tried to do my own noises, it's not working. <laughs> we got Frank Shamrock, Frank Shamrock Jr. Brian, real quick, any major uh, wrestling news we should get to before we start talking with Frank? No, there's nothing happening today. Unless you want to talk about uh, the shutdown that's not taking place. The shutdown's not taking place. They are trying to book uh, dates in April uh, for WCW. Only five dates. It'll be five Mondays because there's going to be no pay-per-view in April. They're still taking the April pay-per-view off to go for a big show on May the 6th. And uh, that's pretty much it. We got an email that I saw, and I don't know if this is right or not, saying that uh, Christian York and Joey Matthews had uh, signed with WWF right before they were going to get a tryout match on WCW on Monday. Yeah, I heard okay. that same thing. Wow. Yeah. WWF's being aggressive. Only when you're going after... They're being aggressive as far as trying to get these guys. Frank, how are you feeling these days? I'm tired. <laughs> no, I feel good. Just, uh, you know, I got this commentator job, so I'm trying to be as professional as possible and interview everybody and do all that stuff. What do you think about the show tonight? It should be an awesome show. I mean, the structure of the show has definitely changed, uh, been upgraded, if you will. They're uh, much more organized and seem to care a lot more about the events, Zufo Productions. Um, all the fights are solid. And I think there's one that I don't really like or don't care for. But other than that, it's a whole solid fight card. Mm -hmm. what do, you, have you, do you know anything about Mark Robinson? Just that he is probably the strongest man ever to walk into the UFC. Yeah. Um, just a monster. I don't think he's all that skilled in fighting. He, he has wrestled and done judo. But we, don't, we yeah. don't know about fighting because there's no... Well, he's really, really accomplished in wrestling. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a really accomplished wrestler. But you know, what does that stand for when you're fighting? Yeah, we'll see. I guess we'll see. What uh, now? You're going under the knife on Monday. Yeah. Uh, how, how did how uh, it was just a accumulation, or did you just or did it just pop one day when you're training? Honestly, it was just one punch, and I felt it. And I was like, you're you know, throwing the punch. I was throwing the punch. What's the injury? It. I have my shoulder scoped on Monday, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I tore some kind of tendon inside my socket or whatever. Um, so whenever I push my hand out in front of me and turn it over, it just feels like there's a knife inside. Uh, I fought my last fight with it. You know, I did this two weeks before my last fight, but I know I can't continue to train uh, at a professional level and have an injury like this. So it takes some time to take care of it. It takes six months. I'll be back in six months. Do you, uh, uh, everyone, the, the, the name everyone always throws at you is uh, Sakuraba. It's politically, how does that stand? And, and I mean, you don't know. You have not signed a contract as far as a fighting contract with this new organization. Uh, would you expect to be a free agent and just work for everyone like you've done before? Or? Yeah, you know, I, I have the luxury of being in a position where I can fight wherever I want, whoever I want. And I want to fight Sakuraba. There's really no one else I care to. Um, I think if the UFC grows, I'll probably be fighting Tito again, but he's still got the belt. Um, but yeah, I'm going to stay a free agent. I'm going to definitely pick up the Sakuraba fight. And then there's new talk that uh, hopefully this maybe this Hickson fight thing will work out, but... Really? I don't believe any of that stuff until they, until I sign a contract, they pay me. What about, you know, you're also uh, trying to promote too, right? Yeah, we've got a new show uh, that just opened up, the Bushido fighting event, and that is a true mixed martial arts show. We're going to do shoot boxing, uh, kickboxing, Muay Thai, San show, and uh, mixed martial arts, or what we call NHB. Um, and we're going to build 
athletes that compete in each sport. So each athlete will compete in each and every sport. Wow, that's going to be really difficult. It'll be difficult, and it's also going to be a, a test for the athletes. And it's going to be, the, you know, we're, we're truly going to develop the ultimate athlete and put them, um, you know, where they got to put it on the line every single time under different rules and try and develop what I call the super, super fighter, you know, that can do anything. What are your thoughts as far as another match with Tito? I mean, we've talked earlier about it, and, and from my standpoint, you basically have nothing to gain except for money, and you have something to lose because you've beaten him. The only motivation for this fight is for him to beat you. He has tremendous motivation to beat you, even though you two are friends. And you're going to have to train, you know, obviously probably harder, harder than, than he does to beat him. Well, I mean, in all honesty, the last time I fought him, I trained as hard as I possibly could. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where else to go from there. But I know that's what the UFC wants. You know, he's their boy. And as long as I have that win over him, he just never gets to, you know, be the big show. Um, he's going to go really far. I, I'll fight him again, but, it, you know, what does it prove to me? It's about money. I know I can beat him. I've already beat him. Um, I know I'll take a lot of damage when I do it again. And I know it'll be really hard, but, you know, if it happens, it happens. You know, one thing that a lot of people, I mean, I think some people know when they watch the fight, um, but a lot of people don't recognize is that, fighting in the weight class that you fight, and I noticed even last night with Elvis Sinisek, who you fought at the Tokyo Dome, you know, you're fighting physically much bigger guys. I mean, Elvis is a lot bigger guy than you. I mean, when you see both of you up, up close to each other, you know, and he has, you know, he's got a lot of reach, he's got a lot of physical advantages over you, and, and so, you know, obviously in a sport like this, you know, you have to be that much better giving up that kind of size, and with Tito, you were giving up, you know, probably in the ring, you know, 22, 25 pounds, to, to, a, to a hell of a wrestler, too. Yeah, it's definitely a disadvantage. You know, I try to use it to to my advantage. You know, I, I I use my speed and I use my scrambling ability and my techniques to try and go around people's power and stuff. But it is definitely an advantage. I think I would be best in like a 185 pound weight class. That's what I am. I'm 183 pounds, and uh, you know, I eat six meals a day so I can be 193. Uh, but you know, that, I, I walk in there exactly like I look today and do my business. And everyone else is cutting weight and doing all these other things. But, and that's the game. That's what I signed on for. So that's what I do. I'm, you know, I, I expect it. And I expect the guy to be bigger and I expect him to be stronger and I expect him to be a better wrestler. But I don't expect him to win. <laughs> <laughs> What's, uh, as far as, as far as this show, um, have you seen Uno fight? I'm sure, I'm sure you have on tape. I have. In fact, I was at the last, uh, Sato Uno fight. Oh, the, the December show. Yeah, yeah, where Uno won the belt and then turned right around and gave it back up. Because he said he didn't care about belts, he just wanted to fight hard fights. Um, this is a guy that he is just so relaxed and so calm and unfazed, and you just—I think people can't put him away. Eventually, they just lose focus or you know lose touch or whatever. From an experience standpoint, he would probably be more experienced than, than Jens, who's he's fighting Jens Pulver, who has a obviously a tremendous punch. If you watched uh, the UFC where he fought John Lewis, it was right here in Atlantic City. Um, you know, he, he knocked John Lewis out with an incredible punch. Monster punch, too. Yeah, yeah. Split his molar and broke his jaw right in half. Wow. So he, yeah, he's definitely a puncher. He's got power. He's got wrestling ability. But I would have to, I definitely have to give the advantage to Uno. You know, he's a guy, he's fought Sato twice. You know, and he fights over in Shuto. And those guys are otherworldly good. You know, they have adapted what they do to that ring, and they know it by heart. I think the one disadvantage for Uno will be that he will be in a cage and not in a ring. And Jens will have a little bit of advantage there, but I look at I look at Uno to do a comeback victory, or what we see on TV as a comeback victory, but what is most likely, Pulver can't put him away, and he's eventually going to lose touch. And yeah, 25 minutes, so. That's a long time. 25 minutes is a long time. 20 seconds in a fight is a long time. <laughs> 25 minutes is, is, a, is another day. How's TV commercial work going? TV commercial work is rocking. I did the Burger King commercial. Yeah, uh, there's a story you're supposed to tell us about that commercial. Uh, <laughs> I did a TV commercial uh, for, for Burger King. That went awesome. And they shot four of them. Four of them are showing right now, uh, national. And... I went out for Old Spice the other day, Old Spice Endurance. They're doing a whole new ad campaign. They're going for the rough kind of athletic guy. So you're not supposed to shave? 
Uh, well, they called. I, I didn't shower or anything. I just showed up. <laughs> I didn't even comb my hair. And in fact, when I got there, I didn't know it. But I, you know, I take my hat off. I do my thing as I'm walking. I look in the mirror, and you know, I just got the sleep head. And I'm like, oh, you know, there's no way they're going to call me back. They call me back the same day. They say, we love you. You're absolutely perfect. We're going to reserve you. February 23rd, be there. And that's the day of the oath. That's today. So I, I called them back, and I was like, well, you know. But you guys mind changing the date of that commercial? I know it's a national commercial and everything. But they never called me back, so. But what do you do? So it's going good. The whole, you know, the commercial thing for me was um, I just said, hey, you know what? Uh, I need money, and, you know, I'll give it a shot. I took, like, one class. They said, you know, look at the camera, talk like this, dress nice, comb your hair. I said, listen. And uh, it's worked out for me. Now, there was a thing, we even talked to you about this, a couple of, I'd say two, three months ago in Full Contact Fighter where Ken and Bob were talking about you. What what did that feel like, you know, reading that? I mean, I, I, mean, I know what it felt like for me just knowing you reading that. Yeah. And, and, like, what did it feel like for you? Well, it was just, it was shocking. You know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't believe it, and I couldn't imagine why they would even say those things. There's obviously some pain going on. There's obviously some, um, you know, unresolved issues that I guess we all need to deal with. But, uh, you know, my message has always been to them. And you got my number, you know where I am, and I love you both. And when you're ready, pick up the phone and we'll deal with it. Yeah. You know, and until then, it's, it, we're just kids, you know, throwing rocks at each other. You know? <laughs> it's silly. What's, uh, what's, 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 how do you like L.A. right now? I don't. Really? Well, well compared to San Jose. You know what it is, it's the traffic. It's just, every, everything is five miles away, but it takes you 30 minutes to get there. And it's just horrendous. You know? And I go on one acting call, and it's a, it's a full day thing. You know, it takes an hour to get there, and you sit there for an hour, and it takes an hour to get back, or two hours, or three hours. Um, other than that, it's exactly the same. I train all day long. I sit at my desk, you know, the rest of the day or night, and I teach class, and I go to bed. So, so it's pretty much the same to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got to run to a commercial break right now. And then, uh, actually we can bring on, uh, why don't we bring on Bobby Heenan real quick? Okay, well, let's, oh, Bobby Heenan's on the line already? Bobby, how you doing? Hello. Hello there. I can barely hear you. On the line. We got, can, uh, everything's, we can hear you fine, Bobby. Okay, I'm, you're a little weak. Okay. There you go. So, jack it up, jack it up. Okay, everything should be fine. Bobby, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good, Dave. How are you? Oh, uh, we're doing, we're doing really good. We're actually here in Atlantic City. We're at, uh, at the UFC. We're talking to Frank Shamrock. You're probably very familiar with his brother, Ken. No, and, I don't uh, know him. <laughs> no, I really don't. No, I really well, I mean, don't. Never in the same no, I've never, they've never, I, I, you've probably never met him, but I'm just saying familiar with him as far as heard of him. Oh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> no, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I just haven't seen the man fight or I haven't seen him wrestle. I saw him a couple times on Vince's show, but that's all. Right, on Vince's. That's what I, that's what I meant on the yeah. show. Um, well, well, hey, should, we, should we just start? Hey, probably, what's your thoughts coming off of the uh, pay-per-view, the WOW pay-per-view that uh, you did the announcing for a couple weeks back? It was really fun to do. They, uh, McLean's people, they really treated me nice, professionally. The girls were very polite. They were hard, uh, workers there. They, they were a little, um, green on some moves and stuff, but, uh, it was interesting to do, and it was a lot of fun. Now, I got, uh, what, what right I find now, myself now looking up trunks. <laughs> <laughs> what, you know, right now is a real pivotal time. I mean, I, I don't know about you, you've been, you've been around wrestling almost, probably almost as long as just about anyone now. 40, uh, 40 years. 40, 40 years. Wow. Except for Mae Young, I guess. And Who's the dater? <laughs> <laughs> I, got a, I actually got a Mae Young story in just a second. but um, I dated her when she had a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> just one. It was, good. it was good for opening cans. <laughs> <laughs> but every time she sat in the bar, some guy would try to light it. <laughs> Good, I gotta ask you a question. Yes. Do we have heat, you and me? Not that I'm aware of. Do me neither. I was okay. doing a radio interview the other day, and some guy said, I hear you're doing Meltzer's show this week. I said, yeah. He said, I thought you two had heat. I said, I only talked to him one time, and I think that was Oakland at the bar. Right, 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 yeah. And I, I said, no, I, I have nothing against David or anybody. Yeah. You know, a lot of yeah. guys don't like dirt sheet guys. Oh, yeah. And my, my, you know, my opinion of you guys are... First Amendment, it's your right to speak, it's your right to write anything. If you don't like the way we're doing something, you have a right to say something about it. You're a fan, I'm 100% I'm for it. You know, what, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is, in, in, in the 40 years that you've been in wrestling, I somehow think 
in, in many ways, maybe maybe you could say the mid '80s was a pivotal, was a very obviously a very pivotal time in the wrestling industry. I think that this year coming up is real pivotal. I mean, I've never been. It's like wrestling is in many ways, from a mainstream standpoint, you know, it's like worlds above uh, what it was for probably most of your career. Yet at the same time, I'm very worried about the business, especially if WCW doesn't make it. You know, I mean, well, you know, Vince McMahon is doing great and all that, but I think that the business needs competition. ECW looks like it's pretty much on its last legs. We're done. And what do you what do you think of? Uh, WCW, the future of WCW, because, I mean, you worked there for several years, and you know where it's at, and you know where it was three years ago, too. I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did. Really? You really. There's, there, there's no direction there. there, there, what, there. Do you, what, what do you think, I mean, do you think, do you think it's so far gone that it can't be resurrected, or do you, what, or what, if you were, if you were put in, in a decision-making power, I mean, what type of things would you do to at least attempt to turn the thing around? I would take everyone that works at WCW and put them in a room and roll in a hand grenade <laughs> <laughs> and start fresh. I would have a I wouldn't have a WCW. I would change the name of it. I would change the look of the belt. Um, talent wise, I don't know where you're going to find talent anymore because everything's been pretty well used up. Uh, but a lot of, there's a lot of good talent out there, but they have to be produced, and that's what I think. I think they have to get back to interviews like with Gene Okerlund. I think they have to get back to uh, finishes. I think they have to have uh, one, two, threes or submissions. I don't think. I think the people are pretty much disgusted now with run-ins and uh, uh, the people going through tables. And I think they just need to get back to uh, entertainment. What's your thoughts as far as you know? One of the things Eric Bischoff just did was basically get rid of all the women. And there's pros and cons to the women. And certainly, I don't. I never liked when they put the women in actual matches because I thought that that kind of it demeaned the product in a lot of ways. But at the same time. You know, the women are a part of the appeal. Uh, do you think that they that they needed to get rid of the women or just, like, make sure to use them smartly? Well, you know, yeah, yeah, that's right. We use them smartly. But, you know, when we had the we when I was there and they had the Nitro girls, I thought they were over. I thought they were hot. And as I, the fans loved them. I used to go to on sales with the Nitro girls, and guys would come and bring them flowers and candy, and they, they were really over. But when they put them in the ring, those girls weren't wrestlers. They, they don't belong in the ring, and they didn't want to be there. So I, 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 go ahead. I think that that was one of the things that killed the Nitro Girls. The mystique of the Nitro Girls was right. trying to make them performers because they weren't performers; they were dancers. That's like taking the Dallas cheerleaders and putting a helmet on, saying "Get in there for a play." <laughs> <laughs> and the results were almost as bad. No, but they, those, that, they, they were a different kind of entertainment, and the, the people loved them. And when we went to break, they'd come out and dance. It'd keep the place hot. The people would be up for everything. Um, you know, and with a woman manager, there's no payoff to it because you can't touch them. You know what I mean? Like China, you can touch because she's, you know, she's a big woman and a muscular woman. But like Elizabeth, I mean, you can't power drive Elizabeth. You do it once, but then she can't be around for six. Months. I never understood why they phased him out at all from the dancing role. I don't know either. I have no idea why. I think everybody, you know, it's like that kind of like a Peter principle, in, where, where everybody they 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 change you to, until the point of uh, where you're no longer valuable. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I don't know where the thinking went there. I mean, they, they they did so many things wrong in production. Like, we were here in Atlanta one time, and uh, Mark McGuire came into town, and Goldberg went out to see him at the, the ballpark. And McGuire ripped Goldberg's shirt off and rubbed his bat on it and went out and hit 70 home runs. Do you think we ever shot it or aired it or anything? No. Vince would have had 27 different angles of that. And he would have gotten on Sports Center and everything. You bet. You bet. Yeah. Okay, we'll start with Dan. Dan Chicago, what's going on? Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey. Hey, Dan. Dan. Whoa. What's this? Whoa. What's this? Hey. They're gone. Someone's breaking in. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll get this. We're going to Sam in New York. Sam, what's up? Hey, guys. Hey, Brain. Uh, you're my favorite commentator. Thank you. And I just think, you, I, I think you're hilarious with your uh, tapoos to go. Oh, yeah. I remember. Um, what was it like working under Vince Russo during his first reign of terror in WCW? <laughs> reign of terror. Okay. I, would even, I wouldn't call it a reign of terror. I would call it a drizzle. <laughs> Uh, I had never had anything to do with the man. I, I maybe spoke to him twice or said hello, or that was about it, but never had a conversation with him. Okay, and um, is there a huge difference between the locker rooms in WCW and, and in the WWF? Well, I haven't been in the WWF locker rooms for uh, six years, and I wasn't in the WCW locker rooms. We had a, our own trailer the announcers had, and I very seldom ever went into the guy's locker room. Okay. So I don't, I don't know. Our locker rooms are locker rooms. A bunch of naked people walking around. They all look alike. <laughs> uh, 
what do you what do you think is the best match that 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 you have ever commentated? Uh, Savage Warrior had a hell of a match in L.A. at a WrestleMania. Okay. And um, boy, there's been some good ones. You know, uh, Rude and Jake the Snake. Um, who do you who do you uh, who do you think is the best commentator today in the business? Um. Well, besides me, I have to say, um... Lee Marshall. <laughs> Not Lee Marshall. I, I was going to say that, but since you said it, I'll just name another one. Uh, I would say, if he was back to commentating, would be Vince McMahon. Huh? And without that, I would say Jim Ross and Mike Tenay. I like Jim Ross, too. Aren't you supposed to say like Mike Tenay, too? Do you, um, will you be commentating <laughs> with Val in the future? Pardon? I'll be with Val in the future. Well, I don't know. I just did that uh, the one pay per view for them, and I haven't talked to him yet about it. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do yet. I just want to. I'm going to do commercials. I want to do. Uh, I just want to have fun. I don't want to be obligated to an organization and under a contract and have to travel all over the world anymore. I just like to have <laughs> fun things, and that's what I want to do. And uh, oh, man, they found out. That? They found out Frank was here. Frank Shamrock's now. <laughs> And now, are you are you going to be writing a book soon? Yes, uh, I'm not sure how soon, but I will be writing a book. I talked to a man the other day who uh, wrote a book with George Burns, and uh, him and I are talking a little bit. And I want to I want it done right. I don't want to be a paperback or look like a, a triple A journal. You know, I want to I want to tell about how I started. How I started. I went to Marigold Arena when I was 10 years old in Chicago, and how I got hooked and started from there, and where I am right today. And I, I want it to be done properly and right. Okay, that's so it. Thanks, you... Brian. Hope to hope to see you in the future. Okay, guys, thank you. Okay, so now you so you started watching pro wrestling. Was it early or mid fifties? Uh, I was ten years old. It was nineteen fifty four. So was it still on national television, or would it have been right after losing national television? Or do you even remember? I remember when it came on Dumont Network, which was the ABC. I'm not sure when they lost or, or what happened to that because I, I left there in nineteen sixty Chicago. And, uh, the wrestling we had on in Chicago at that time was uh, Vince McMahon's from Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1959. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And that's where they plugged and they put the Rogers O'Connor match together. What is there any of all the, you know, you've been everywhere basically and in and, and all these different eras. Is there, what was your favorite era uh, to be an announcer, to be just part of the business? What was the most, I mean, as far as most fun and you thought like where wrestling was the hottest? I had a, I had a lot of fun in the 70s in the AWA because I was with a lot of good people, you know, like uh, the Black uh, Jack Lanza and uh, Dr. X and Ray Stevens and Bach Winkle and uh, all those people. That was a lot of fun. And, and the 80s were a lot of fun, too, in New York. That was a different – that turned everybody's head around because now we started being mainstream and we were doing things on national TV and we were involved with Dick Ebersaw on NBC and stuff. And it, it was, that was exciting. When did you start with the WWF? What year? 85, I think. 85? So yeah. when did you first think about Vince when he started to expand? Uh, pardon? Did you see him as like Vince as like a visionary when he started to expand, or did you see him as like, how can this guy be doing this? Well, you know, there, all the promoters were against Vince, naturally, because he was coming into their area. Mm -hmm. But if you really think about it, there's four gas stations on four corners, so I think anybody can run in anybody's town. Nobody owns a town. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great, and... Uh, it was exciting to watch another person's tape and see, see what their talent was doing and their, their angles and how things were going. And, and Vince just did it right. We got, you know, one of the things, the, the managing thing, which you did for most of your career, managing has turned into almost like a lost art. Um, and I'm not even sure why. I know why. Why? Because when I started in 1965 in the ring, before that I was carrying jackets, setting the rings, and doing all kinds of stuff. But when I started, a manager was a young kid breaking into business. There was an old guy that couldn't work anymore. And what happens with it now is no managers get, there's, there's, there's too much. There's too many girl valets. There's too many men valets. And people don't know what they're doing. They, they don't align themselves with one individual character. And they don't know how to get themselves over. It's very simple. You've got to manage like a wrestler and wrestle like a manager. That's all you have to do. When I was outside that ring and my man was in there, every time he took a bumper, got hit, I reacted. Because I had an initial investment in the man. But when I got in the ring, actually, I didn't want to be there. I wrestled as a manager. 
Well, one of the one of the things um, you know, and I remember this from from the AWA territory, that like with, with, especially in the period when Bachwinkle was champion and you were Bachwinkle's manager. I mean, the, it was the act. I mean, I think you know when you left and went to the WWF. I mean, there was a real void in Bachwinkle's act. And you know, but not, and this is not to knock Bachwinkle because I always thought Bachwinkle was a tremendous performer and and, and all that. But it, it, you know, and that's why I kind of think that you know there there are certain wrestlers who. And it's not even like, obviously, Bachwinkle was a good interview. But there are certain wrestlers who the right manager can enhance their appeal to a great degree. And obviously, you did that with many people in the AWA, with Lanza as well, and, and many others. Um, that's why I think that, like, this, you know, not having managers in the two big companies, although I guess Vince McMahon and, and uh, his son and his daughter, I guess, play the role of his managers in a sense, it, it's kind of something that, you know, it's, it's, it's something that worked. It worked for many years. You know, you, Cornette, a lot of people drew, you know, drew big money in your role. Yeah. It's sort of not there. Well, they they don't they think it's uh, old hat. They don't know how to they don't know how to do it. Is what it is, and they don't have anybody that can do it. And they don't know how to train anybody to do it. Uh, they want to use the women. They want to use all the TNA and stuff. Well, that looks fine. But most of those women are so built up that you can go to a Sears and see the same thing on a mannequin, and the mannequins <laughs> are softer. <laughs> so so a beautiful woman is one thing. Even work anymore? A woman, a beautiful woman in a nice outfit is something to see. A woman with her lips made real big and had a, a breast job done and, and wearing skimpy clothes, it doesn't look real. It's, 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 it's the Wizard of Oz, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a role for the uh, traditional manager today, or is it just not going to work with just everybody running around? Uh, I think it'll work. I think you just have to get it back to, uh, you have to get, you have to reverse it a little bit. You have to slow down. Everybody's going so, so, so fast that they, they kill a program in three weeks. And they don't take time to develop the characters. If you can develop a character, just can't have a manager show up out of nowhere. This guy's got to have a little bit of a history. He's got to have money. He's got to be from some place. He's got to, he's got to be sneaky. He's got to be uh, obnoxious. He's, he's, he, but he can't yell and scream. Uh, they can't wear sunglasses because there's so much expression in people's eyes. You have to see. Um, everybody has long hair and a beard. They look like they're the guy sitting in the front row. They don't know how to do anything different. You know, there, we just got an email here, and, and it actually, it, it, from, from Ben, and it just goes, uh, you know, and, and it almost talks about, like, uh, one of the big problems in wrestling. And it goes, he wants to comment on what he used to like about you was your ability to get what was basically unknown talent to the in, in the WWF. I mean, not that they were unknown to people who followed wrestling everywhere, but you'd bring a, a guy cold, so to speak, to that audience, and you could immediately get them over and go, Bobby was so good in his role. We were programmed to hate whoever he brought in and hate them, you know, even after, you know, you weren't with them anymore. And that's one of the things. If you have a manager who's really, you know, one of the problems is that everyone complains about is they'll bring in a new guy, and then three weeks later they'll go, oh, you know, he can't get over. And it, because they're not aligned with any, you know, they're just brought in cold. Because they don't know. Usually the people don't know how to, they don't know how to produce, and, they, and some of those guys don't know how to be produced. A lot of managers you'll see at ringside, when their man's in the ring uh, getting heat on the guy, they'll be out there yelling to the fans, and they're a distraction. They don't really know how to put themselves in that character. Let's go to Jay in Michigan. Jay, what's up? AJ, Bobby, it's nice to talk to you. I can barely hear you. Jay, speak um, up. It's nice to talk to you, Bobby. Thank you. Um, I got a couple questions for you. Okay. In the uh, early 1990s, you were on the uh, Arsenio Hall show, mm -hmm. and you walked off the show. And I was curious if that was planned, um, or if you had planned it and not told Arsenio, um, or exactly what trans uh, when, what transpired there and uh, caused that. In what? Our Senior Hall show? Yeah, I walked off, but what you said, I, I didn't hear the end of your question. Well, I was just curious as to um, if that was planned um, beforehand or if you just decided right then and there to go ahead and walk off. I just decided there to walk off. I never talked to our Senior before the show, after the show I did, but uh, I walked off and he was happy with it. He's a, he's a real nice guy. Oh. He's real easy to work with. Um, uh, in front of the scenes in WCW right now, um, it's it's um, similar to the AWA in the sense that they don't promote new guys and they haven't changed with the times. Uh, would you say behind the scenes it's similar to the AWA in their their last dying days as well? Well, I wasn't in the AWA in their last dying days. When I was there, it was a territorial promotion, and we did all our TV at the Showboat, and we did some in Minneapolis at Channel 11. Uh, we didn't go to all these different venues and have the pyro and big ramps and stuff like that. So it was just a a, a, a territorial promotion. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. 
Frank, this is one person who says, what do you think of Vitor Belfort saying that you are scared to fight him? I'm obviously scared to fight him. Um, he probably just knocked me out really quickly. <laughs> I, don't know. I, don't, I don't have a lot of time to put energy into what people say. You know, Vitor, he was a ball of fire in his time, and he just burned down. You know, and uh, the big matchup was supposed to be me and him, but he never made it to the big show. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do about that. And it says, uh, what was it like to be attacked by my dog? <laughs> <laughs> that dog is insane. <laughs> Trying to chew my leg off for no reason. Dave claims the dog is like you now. Is that a lie? Well, Remember last I, time you were over, the dog did like you. I don't know if he liked you. He was looking at me with a thin eye. He was kind of pacing around. I don't really know, but we, we sort of came to an agreement. <laughs> what, and it goes, uh, what do you think of the uh, Sakuraba Silva fight? I like that fight. I like Silva's chances. He, of course, he's got a puncher's chance, which is, you know, a, a huge plus. Um, I think he's too stiff. I think Sakuraba will tool him because he's just too stiff. And mm -hmm. Sakuraba is so relaxed. And what do you think of Gilbert Ivel? I like Gilbert Ivel. Super guy. Just, uh... He's just not good enough on the ground yet, but he is, uh, you know, he's like 22 or 23 or something insane like that. He's the, he's the next generation. He's going to be phenomenal. But he's got to learn to get off his back and avoid a takedown. He's, he's got to learn. He's down, he can't get off. He's got to learn to get up, and he's got to learn to expend energy there. And he's kind of in that in-between grappler kickboxer thing where he's still working on timing and stuff. But he needs to get moving on the ground and get working on the ground. This work. Uh, you got to work down there. Let's go to the phone call. We got Wesley. Wes, what's going on? Hey guys, I want to ask Bobby. Uh, what did he think of Vince Russo? How he treated a lot of the bigger names? Uh, you know, like how he handled the situation, replacing you with uh, Mark Madden. It seemed like he really tried to do everything. To, you know, I know they needed to create obviously new stars, but he really seemed like he wanted to come in and really didn't respect a lot of the older names. No, he didn't. Um, one of the reasons that he refused to uh, honor the last year of my contract. I read where Russo said he wanted more of a MTV, a younger look. So he hired Madden. Actually, I think, though, what was it? Um, but it's like getting rid of Pamela Sue Anderson and having Zsa Zsa be on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, he uh, I don't think he understood the business. But he thought he did think he did, though. Well, you know, a lot of people that think they understand things, but they haven't been in it. They don't know. You, they don't, you don't know unless you've been in that ring. You don't know unless you deal in that dressing room, unless you deal with promotions. You can't come from a writing aspect and, and, and run the business. You have to know the business and understand it. You know, I, I, I've been in the wrestling almost 40 years. I couldn't go do baseball or do football or basketball as much as I like those sports. I still haven't been there, and I still haven't, uh, I, I'm not knowledgeable like a Pat Summerall or a John Madden is. Now, I got a question, because you actually did bodybuilding once. How was that? Oh, that was easy, because uh, me and the barbarian went there. The guy's name was Haney? Fred Haney, Haney or something? That's the guy with the pig. Haney. What? I don't think that. Fred, did you say Fred Haney? Fred Haney's the guy with the pig on, on uh, Green Acres, Haney, I think. Haney but, on Green Acres, yeah. But there, there was a, a, a Haney or something like that, a real nice there a man. Lee, there was a Lee Haney who was a bodybuilder. That's it. We did his show, uh, Barbarian and I, and he just worked out for him and everything. I just laid on the bench and read the paper and had a Coke. No, I mean, you, 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 you announced Vince's pay-per-view about ten years ago with Luger and all. Well, actually, Luger was hurt. Um, but I remember Vince did a pay-per-view and you did the announcing. With Gene? You don't remember that? For the boxing? I mean, for, uh... The body, the body Oh, thing. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that was done in, uh, Long Beach. That was Tom Platts and I and Vince. Right. Yeah, we did that. Uh, I know nothing about bodybuilding. I don't know a trap from an ab <laughs> to a six-pack. I just sat there and everybody came out. I just said, this guy's the biggest guy I've ever seen. Next guy came out. This guy's bigger. Who do you think? I think this guy's going to win. Finally, the last guy won. I knew he'd win. <laughs> and everybody sat in the audience in Zubas and World Gym T-shirts. <laughs> How was Cauliflower Alley? It was great. It was great. Uh, I'm going to be doing it every year now, uh, Tanae and I. And uh, it was good to see a bunch of people I haven't seen for a while, like Bill Watts and Pampero Furpo and my good friend Red Bastine and the Big K and, uh, you know, Penny Banner and Kay Noble. It was, it's fun seeing those people. Wes, are you still there? Yeah, I want to ask, Bobby, what do you think of the Brian Pillman angle in WCW? What happened with the Clash of the Champions when uh, the curse word got <laughs> oh, over the year? Story. Um, 
When you when you do, when you're doing color or play by play, you watch a monitor. You don't look in the ring because if you watch action in the ring, they may not be shooting that. So you can only call what you see. So I'm watching the monitor, and Pillman gets out of the ring and goes up behind me. And I had just had the, I broke my neck in '83, and I had just had surgery in '95. And they took two discs out and put two bones from my hip in, and everybody knew not to touch me. So Pillman just came around the ring, and all he did was pull my coat down over my shoulders. But I thought it was a fan. And I jumped up, and I said, what the? And that's what happened. Also, Bobby, in all the years that you've been in, who were some of the guys that you think that you were surprised that didn't make it to be bigger stars? Um, that I managed? Well, just people, you know, around the business around. in general. Oh, God, there's so many you know, of them. like a guy you saw coming in and go, this guy's going to make it, and then for whatever reason, politics or just they didn't make it for some reason. Well, you know, the, uh, the big show, I thought he had a chance. Yeah. But I think what, what hurt him is he, he started taking bumps. He just became a, a long-haired big guy who looked like a bouncer in a, in, in a boob bar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, he should have never gone off his feet. Goldberg, Goldberg should have never been beaten. Mm -hmm. oh. Never. He could have gone 2,000. See, he's Jewish. Do you know how many Jewish people out there that own TV stations and industries and commercials and, indus <laughs> and products? Really, and you've never had a Jewish champion. And they would love this guy, and he would be great for the business. That's what I always thought. What do you What do you think? I mean, like before that, they did the uh, the heel turn on Goldberg because I remember going into that. I guess it was last July, and I mean it was kind of out there that, that they had asked him to do it, and he was grudgingly willing to do it. And I thought, what, I mean, to me watching it, it was like, why are they doing this? I mean, one, it was too early, and two, it was like, you know, they already had heard him, but it's like, why? He was the only guy people believed in in the company. Why, like, he's, he's like screwing the fans. You know what I mean? Oh, I know exactly what you mean. I, I never understood why they did that either. And I, first of all, when they, they did make him a heel, people still liked him. He wasn't really a heel, because he probably only lasted a heel an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nothing they ever... Don't forget, we had two producers there. Uh, one was a, used to be a makeup girl that couldn't get her eyelashes and her eyebrows straight. <laughs> and the and, and the other one used to be a receptionist, and they made them producers. That explains they the couldn't produce a flatulent at a bean convention. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my God! Do you think that uh, beating Goldberg was like the death blow, or do you think that they've been dying for a long time and that was just another nail? I think I think uh, there was a few nails in that coffin, but the big nail was Goldberg. I don't think that helped at all. That he could have saved everything. Had they, made, had they kept him the champion. And they, they didn't know how to market people. They don't know how to market people at all or merchandise or anything like that, in my opinion only. So, uh, I, you know, getting back to Eric Bischoff, Eric Bischoff and I, I don't know if he likes me or not, I don't really care, but as far as I'm concerned, he gave me uh, three contracts and gave me two raises. I have no heat with Eric Bischoff. Anything else, Wes? I just want to say, Bob, me, I enjoyed your work, and uh, good luck to whatever ventures you uh, go into in the future. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate right. that. Okay, we got Dan here. Dan is back. Dan, what's going on? Guys, I apologize about that earlier. Um, Mr. Heenan, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you, sir. How are you doing? Good, fine. Um, hey, listen, I, I started watching pro wrestling, like, when Mr. Wonderful first turned on Hulk Hogan when you started managing him. What was the original... Angle between you and Hogan. I never understood. So all of a sudden, it's like you hating Hogan all the time. I never understood like the main issue between the both of you. Well, don't forget he was he was a big huge star in the AWA. Yeah. And I was there with Bockwinkle as the world's champion. He was trying to get at Bockwinkle. And so when I went from the AWA to the WWF, it just rolled over. Okay. So that was the whole. Wait, wait. When Hogan first showed up in the AWA, they, they actually brought him in to be a heel with Johnny Valiant. Mm -hmm. And and the people took to him so much that they went babyface with him. Well, I was in what, Go ahead. Okay. At what point, at, at what point, um, I mean, when you saw Hogan, did you, in, in, in Minneapolis, did you think that he was going to be as big as he was? Or did you, or did that surprise you that he got as big as he was? Well, first of all, I knew Hogan before he went to the AWA. I was, in 1979, I was in the NWA in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, managing superstar Bill Eady, and I was with, uh, Killer Carl Cox and Black Jack Lanza. And, uh, Hogan started wrestling down here, and they gave him the name Sterling Golden. Mm -hmm. And he, I, I never saw a guy that big. He just was huge. And then, then when I, I left there in November of 79, and I told Vern about this guy in Wally, I said, this is the guy you gotta get your hands on. 
And then he went to New York, and Vince Sr. gave him the name uh, Hulk Hogan. And then he went right from there to Minneapolis. And when I came back from Japan, the program started. Right. Now, what exactly was the um, uh, the neck injury that you got in 83? Was it just cumulative injuries from taking bumps, or what exactly? I was in Japan. I was at Harley Race, and I went to tag with Haku and a guy named Onida. Mm-hmm. And Onida does a lot of goofy stuff. Later. Pardon? Onida actually became really famous later. Yeah, but this was uh, 83. And he, you know how Hogan drops the big leg on you? Yeah. He came off the top rope and dropped the big leg in my face. And it took my head to the left. And that's what tore everything. He didn't mean to do it. It was, he just missed his mark. Yeah, you so it Hogan, you said? No, Pardon? No, it was Haku, Haku, Haku and Onita. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, you, you and you were uh, in, in there, like in the AWA days and all through the 70s. I mean, you were known for that spot, um, you know, where whether it would be Dick the Bruiser or whomever, would be chasing you around the ring, and you would take that, you know, like some of those crazy bumps and then skedaddle over the top rope. And some of those that probably didn't didn't help in the long run either, wouldn't you think? Or or did they or that or is, or is that not have anything to do with it with your neck problems? Um, I don't know. I just know that my, I, I never had any problem with my neck or anything until he dropped in my face that day. Mm-hmm. And then I got up and my my whole left my neck never hurt. It hurt from my shoulder into my wrist, but never into my hand. And my little finger in my left hand stood straight out for a while. Then that went away. And then as as you take more bumps, and uh, you're up in Minneapolis where it's 18 below in July, and you get and it just wears on your body, and you take more bumps, and age, you don't heal like you do at 20 as you do, as you do thinking you're 30, 40. So, 28. Yeah. <laughs> so how so, long did you take bumps after that? How long, uh, when was basically the last time you decided to take any at all? Uh, the last time I worked was in uh, 91 against Fuji in Long Island. Uh-huh. That was my last match. Because I remember a match, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was like you were standing on the apron, and I think it was the Ultimate Warrior gave you a clothesline or something like that, and it was just, it was like a shot from your waist up, and he gave you this clothesline, and you like did a complete flip, and you just disappeared off the screen, and I just saw your feet coming up, and it was like the craziest bump I'd ever seen in my whole life. Should have been on my honeymoon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of stuff that the Warrior you couldn't control. <laughs> Hey, what was it like working with Ali? With who? Muhammad Ali. I never worked with him. No, didn't you took a bump in 76 in Chicago? I remember watching on Wide World of Sports. Oh, I didn't take a bump. I, uh, he, was, he was in the ring. He had an exhibition with uh, Buddy Wolf and Kenny J. And then Nick and I were to get in the ring and challenge him. And we got in the ring and just challenged him. That was for the Ali and Anoki thing. Right, it was before, right before the Ali and Anoki thing, yeah. yeah, I, remember yeah Howard, you... I remember Howard Cosell announcing it and... Uh, and him giving you a big haymaker, and you taking a big bump, and then, uh, and then, uh, and the whole, the whole thing. Howard Cosell's announcing this, this is on network TV, and and he's just going like, in all of this, you know, Ali could still get hurt, you know, while he was doing, you know, doing the the Buddy Wolf match. You know, the funny thing is, I don't remember taking a bump. Yeah. I wish I could see a tape of that. Yeah, yeah, you did. No, you I don't remember that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember one thing Ali said to me the first time I met him. He said, "Are you a good guy or a bad guy?" <laughs> I said, "I'm a bad guy." He said, do you guys, you guys get a lot of women? <laughs> and that's what he asked me. But he was, re- he was real, uh, real cordial, really a nice man. Let's go to uh, John in Texas. John, what's going on? Uh, not much. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. Hey, Bobby, what's up? How you doing? I'm good. Um, listen, I've been a fan for, for a long time. I remember uh, growing up and, and watching you, uh, and, and I remember, like, uh, you and Vince had a Saturday morning show on USA, and I think that that was probably like uh, my most fond memories of of you on on TV because you and Vince did like these uh, like these skit you know these little skits that were just hilarious all the time. I was wondering, you know, what was that like working with Vince on USA and and doing that show? Well, I started in 1965. And I went to New York in 1985. So I had already been in the business 20 years. When I went to work for Vince McMahon, it was the biggest eye-opener of my life. He was the best producer I've ever been around. He knew how to get the best out of anyone. And he took his time with you. He didn't insult you. I want it this way. This is the way it should be. Try it this way. You can maybe do 50 takes, but he'd get the right one, and he made you feel confident. And he gave me and a lot of other guys the ability to go do these other things in, uh, in different areas of television and stuff that we never did before. 
and he was uh, he was the best at producing that I've ever been around in my life. You've mentioned that uh, that you you still talk to Vince and that you guys uh, are still still friends and on the level and everything. Can you see yourself like maybe going to work for the WWF and and, and getting back into commentary uh, on that side? Well, you know, I'll do anything for money. And uh, <laughs> and I, I talked to Vince in November and we talked a little bit about football. And I just told him I was available, and I know he's got WrestleMania coming up. And if he's got something for me, fine. If he don't, fine. Uh, he, he's still a nice man and a good friend of mine, and I, I wish their company the best. You don't have to because they're doing so good, but no, he's, he was just the best producer of wrestling. He just had that Midas touch. He just knew what to do. Yeah, it shows for sure. Um, sure look it, at the numbers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you stay in touch with, uh, like, who all do you stay in touch with now? I mean, are, are you in contact at all with Hulk Hogan or, no. or anybody I, I, on, the, on the WCW side now? No. You know, when I, when I, come, I, I talk to Tanae, but when I come home or I'm home, I have my life with my family and my, my friends outside the business. I never wanted to be around people in the business 24 hours a day because all you wind up doing is talking wrestling and it gets so stale and all everybody does is have sour grapes and no place to spit the seeds. It's just horrible. So if you have another life and then you go to work, and that makes that part of your life different. But as far as keeping contact, I keep in contact a little bit with Red Bastien, uh, Jack Lanza, Angelo Mosca, uh, stuff. I used to keep in contact with Ray Stevens a lot, with one of my, and then Gorilla Monsoon before they passed away. Those are some of my best friends, uh, Ray Stevens and Gorilla. Would you, would you rate Ray Stevens the best worker that you ever worked with? The best. Yeah. The best hero, the best baby face was Red Bastien. Really? Mm-hmm. Impeccable timing. What? I, 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 have you ever? I, I know that at one point or in the eighties, I know that this must have been. Oh, and Dick Murdoch. Put him in there. Dick Murdoch. Boy. Murdoch was, was like, tremendous. Oh yeah. But you know what Murdoch's trouble was? Why like, he never got a title or a belt? He wanted to be Carl Cox. He wanted to do silly things. Yeah, he always wanted to be comedy, and he. Uh, yeah, and yeah. also, you never knew which Dick Murdoch you would get. You'd either get the like the greatest worker in the world, or you'd mm -hmm. get this guy who would take every shortcut in the world. See, what I would do is I would. I would do all my shtick outside, but when I got in the, when I got in the ring, I worked. Mm -hmm. and, the, and Murdoch, he liked to play. He was so good, he he, he liked to play. Have you been watching much of uh, WWF? You've been uh, watching Kurt Angle. Yes, I I, I like him. I like him a lot. Do you think he kind of has that same problem where it's just so much comedy outside the ring that people really don't take him seriously in the ring? How big is Kurt Angle? Five ten. Five ten, probably two. Thirty? Is this not right? Maybe a little. Well, bit. that might be his only problem because WWF always had huge men. Mm -hmm. You know, like Andre and Stud and that. A lot of people don't know. When I was hired by Vince to go to the WWF, I was hired to manage Jesse. Yeah. And Jesse and had blood clots in his leg, or something happened to him in San Diego, and he couldn't make it to the Garden that night. So that was my first time at the Garden. Vince put me with Stud. Mm -hmm. That's how that happened. Has anyone talked to you about doing sitcoms? Has that ever, like, come up? Um, no, it hasn't. I, I, I've had a couple agents. But, you know, I don't live in L.A., so, but you have to go to calls, and you have to go for readings and stuff. And I'm not going to fly out there three times a week and sit in a room with a bunch of people and read for something that, that I don't get <laughs> the thing at. I, I, I don't need that job. So, I, you know, those guys, those professional actors, out there, they really work for what they do, and they really work hard, and they're there for all the calls. And I just couldn't be... Uh, outside the, you know, while I was still in the business. Mm -hmm. Bobby the Brain and Frank Shamrock. Frank Shamrock Jr. were a couple hours away from the UFC. Tito Ortiz and Evan Tanner for the middleweight title, main event, and uh, first world bantamweight championship match. Caro Uno from Japan against Jens Pulver and plus uh, Josh Barnett and Pedro Hizzo. Bobby Heenan, Bobby Heenan, Bobby Hoffman against Mark Robinson. God, I don't think Bobby Heenan would want to fight Mark Robinson at this point. No! <laughs> Former World's Strongest Man competitor, Elvis Sinisek, who Frank fought in December against Jeremy Horn and uh, Bobby Onoeha against Phil Johns, a couple of prelims. They'll probably, uh, some of those fights would be on TV. What, what do you think of Elvis Sinisek, Frank? I really like the fight uh, between him and Horn. You know, they're, they're similar styles. I fought them both. They both gave me a great run. You know, they both took me over, whatever, you know, 12, 15 minutes, which is, you know, unheard of for me. Um, <laughs> They're, they're similar styles. Uh, I think uh, Horn has the huge experience advantage. And, in fact, uh, right after the fight, we are at the post-fight party, and Elvis says, you know, they, they, they're, they're asking me to fight Horn. What do you think? did, probably. 
I said, don't do it. <laughs> I said, don't do it. <laughs> but uh, he did it. They did it. What was it like fighting in front of 70,000 people? It was unnerving. Uh, I had never done a show so large. I would never done a show where um, there was just so much heat and focus and everything on the whole event. And then it's, it, yeah, they don't say anything. And it's 70,000 people, and they're not saying anything. And that's just really unnerving. <laughs> they're, all not, they're just going, you know, his shorts don't fit right. It's just, <laughs> it's, you know, it's just weird. It was weird. They need to say something. Let's go to uh, Tom in California. Tom, what's going on? Hey, how you guys doing? Doing really good. I have uh, one question for Bobby. I know that uh, you're around when the Vince did the WBF. Mm -hmm. What do you think he's doing different with the XFL now that that's out? What do I think he's doing different? Yeah, to make it kind of successful. I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, what I, it, it's a different thing. The bodybuilding and the football is a whole different thing because you've got different camera shots and the, they're different people. Um, <laughs> they're real different. Yeah. I, the only thing I don't like about the XFL is I don't like all that talk on the sidelines and, and in the dressing rooms and stuff. Nobody has anything good to say. But, but you know what I do like about it? Uh, I like the kickoff, where they run and go for the ball. I like that, too. And I like where they have to go for the point. They don't get to kick it. I like stuff like that. And these guys are hard guys. They're, they're, they're guys that work, and they just want to make it, and they just, they just want to play football. Now, there's, about, there's a market for anything. What do you think about him using uh, wrestling announcers for the football games? Well, that's called cross-promotion. I don't know. People say, like, Jim Ross really isn't that good. Well, I, I think Jim Ross knows an awful lot about football. I know that. I think that, that part of it is is that, that there's a lot of people who are... They just say it's wrestling. Yeah, they, they, Jim Ross is, is tagged with that wrestling tag, and it doesn't matter how good he is, they're going to tag him with that and say, like, you know, he replaced Matt Baskersian, who, who did not do as well as Jim Ross on the first week, yeah. but Matt Baskersian did baseball with Milwaukee Brewers, so those sports people are going, they replaced a real sports announcer with a wrestling announcer, and Jim Ross was doomed. It didn't matter if he was good, bad, or indifferent. Plus, he he does have that wrestling element in his announcing, which a lot of the sports people didn't didn't want. They didn't want the real heavy hype. But I mean, about you watched. I thought last week Jim Ross did did you know did very very well. And Jesse was a lot better the third week too. Well, you know, everybody will get better the more they get comfortable with the situation and everything. Um, I I think you probably should have had NBC announcers. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think people that see the wrestling announcers do it, they don't think the football is real. Yeah. yeah, that was one of the big concerns. Um, and I don't know why. I, I don't know why because of wrestling. Uh, a friend of mine, Eddie Einhorn, is uh, with the White Sox. And I, I, I asked Eddie one day, I said, I got an idea. Why don't I do an announcer's thing on the seventh inning from the, the stands and just sit there and talk to the fans for, you know, the seventh inning stretch? And he said, because you're from wrestling. They, they won't accept the baseball people. And unless you're legitimate and stuff, they won't accept you. All right, well, thanks for taking my call. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to Chris in Toronto. Chris. Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey. Really good. Good. I had a couple questions for Brain. Mm -hmm. Um, The first one, um, is Ernest Miller really that tough? He was talking about kicking everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. the earlier or something Ernest like that. Someone was talking about it. But I mean, he right people think he's got Ernest a job. Miller? Ernest the Cat Miller. Well, I've never had anything to do with martial arts, but they say he's a world champion. I, he, I guess he has the credentials. I don't know. I've never seen him fight, and I've never seen him... Uh, in that situation, uh, Ernest Miller's a nice guy to me, and I think he's a talented talker. Oh, so do I. I just wasn't, I was wondering if he was as tough as he says, that's all. Well, none of us are. <laughs> I was going to say that. It's all true. He's tougher than a Waffle House steak. My next question, Bobby? Yes. Was, uh, I guess you were with WCW for what, six years? Yeah. How many times, honestly, did you look over at Tony Schiavone and just want to slap him in the back of the head for not catching on to what you were saying or just basically being stupid? Well, Gorilla Monsoon told me he was going to call Tony two times and tell Tony he don't know how to work with Bobby. But I told him not to. Tony, you know, Tony Schiavone, since I was released here, he never has called me. He lives a mile from me. Mm -hmm. He's never called me, wished me good luck, bad luck, or anything. Nothing. Right. Of all the people at WCW here, I got calls from a makeup girl named Maxie. I got calls from Keith Mitchell, one of the producers. I got calls from uh, guys all around the country. Tony Schiavone has never called me. Well, that says a lot about Tony Schiavone. I hope to see you on SmackDown or something, Brain. You should be back in wrestling. Well, uh, it's fun. You know, I, I just want to have fun now. I just, 
I, I, I want to do personal appearances and stuff like that, and like I did the Cauliflower Alley Club, that was great, and I just want to do things like that. I don't want to be bogged down and obligated to do something every week that I don't want to do. Well, cool. Good luck in your future, Bobby. Well, thank you. I just want to say it's up to everybody in the chat room, man. Okay, cool. All right. What was it like working with uh, Dusty Rhodes? Um, well, you never knew if you were at a rodeo <laughs> or a uh, hey Ashbury. <laughs> but Dusty was no problem. Dusty, Dusty, you didn't understand everything he said, but he was entertaining, I thought. And I thought he, I had no problem with him. Mm -hmm. Not that I had problem with anybody. We got, we got an email from Frank. Frank, what's, what's your thoughts of a potential fight with Yuki Kondo? Not, don't want to do it? Not interested? Interested? Are between me and Kondo? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to fight Kondo. I like, um, yeah, I like him as a fighter. I like what he brings to the table. I don't think personally he's all that tough. You know, I, when I fought him, you know, I never make excuses for what I did, but, you know, I wasn't on my best day, and Kondo got me that day, but, uh, it's a world of difference now. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a fight I'd be interested in because it would, it's got a good story, and, uh, it could be one of them makeup fights where I beat up someone that got me at one point, so, uh, you never know. What about Tamara? I like that fight. Uh, yeah, that was a hell of a fight. That was one of the most entertaining fights I think I've, I've seen. Yeah, and a great response. Everyone, everyone liked the fight. Um, I knew going in it would be a hard fight. I knew he's kind of like you know, we're kind of like he's the Japanese version of me. I'm the American yeah, yeah, version so of him. Yeah, and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to fight him under less rules. The rings rule last time really limited me. I felt uh, I almost knocked him out with open hands a couple times, but um, yeah, that'd be a fun fight. I, I like all those fights. The, the good thing about the middleweight class, yeah, there's 50 guys, and they're all top-notch. And any guy on any day can beat anybody else. Let's go to uh, Charles in Pittsburgh. Charles, what's going on? Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, not too much. Hey, I had a question for uh, Bobby and Frank. I'll start off with Frank. Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, I want to get your uh, predictions on a couple fights coming up, and that was the... Uh, Silva and uh, Sakuraba and uh, Ken and uh, Vochanchin fight. Well, I think uh, I think Sakuraba will take Silva. I was saying earlier, I think he's just too relaxed. I think he'll just be too smooth, and he won't. He'll just uh, he'll use so little energy that he'll have more towards the end to clean up the deal. Uh, Ken Shamrock, Igor Volchanchian. Uh, I think Volchanchian will win. Uh, Ken should win by every right. Ken has every ability to win, style-wise, wrestling-wise. He could easily beat Volchanchian, but I see Ken get knocked out uh, just because I think that um, he has a difficult time changing game plans when, it, when, it, when the heat comes on, and I think that may be his downfall. But I hope that I'm wrong. Uh, do you think with the uh, new rules that uh, it will favor uh, Vanderlei against uh, Sakuraba? Hmm. I think, yeah, kicking to the head, knees to the head. I think it will favor Vandalay slightly. Um, but again, I just think he's too stiff. He's always got the puncher's chance. He's a, he's a hell of a puncher. But he's so stiff, uh, you know, he's so serious and a ball of uh, tension there that I think Sakuraba can run circles around him. With Ken, with Ken if, if you were coaching Ken against Igor, what would the game plan be? I would tell Ken... Run out, hit him with the right hand, and shoot on him. You know, Ken's got a great right hand. He's got tons of power in it, and he um, is a devastating striker when he uses wrestling to set it up. But when he's just a striker, he's not a striker. And I'm not a striker. I don't claim to be. Uh, but you know, I that's a tough fight to call. But I think that will chance him to come out on top. But do, you, but do you think Ken could, like, keep him down on the ground? Because it seems like the only person that could really do, do that was Coleman, and that was after, like, with Chanson already had two fights and he was already tired. Yeah, I think I think Ken can keep him down. Um, but they have rounds in this, right? It's ten, five, uh, ten minute it'd be rounds? Ten, ten minutes and two fives. Yeah, so, you know, they have rounds, and that's a, that's a big problem. Um, Ken, Ken has... He's kind of one of those ego fighters. You hit him, and he's got to hit you back, and that's the wrong game to play in this one. And I hope he plays the smart way, because he can take him out easily. And uh, my last question was for uh, Bobby. Uh, Bobby, I was wondering if you could uh, tell a couple uh, 
Andre uh, drinking stories because I heard you you started to tell one about uh, on WCW Live where the one where you guys were in a uh, bar and he uh, they called for last call and I guess he ordered a bunch of drinks or something. But uh, I'll go I'll go ahead and uh, hang up and listen. Thanks for taking my calls, guys. Okay, very welcome, Andre. You were around Andre a ton. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we got on a plane one morning in Chicago going to Omaha. I think he used to like to have a few in the morning, like four or five triples. So he gets on the plane and we're in first class and he's pulling up the armrest between us that, you know, you can remove that and just gives him a little more room. And the stewardess comes by and she says, what can I get you? So Andre says, screwdriver. So about ten minutes goes by, she comes back and hands him a screwdriver, a, a black and decker screwdriver. <laughs> You know, Andre says to her, what would you have brought me if I'd have said Bloody Mary? <laughs> so I take this through in the uh, galley. I said, ma'am, you may be new at this, but this is maybe, maybe will help you with your job. When a guy gets on the plane and he's seven foot five and he weighs 550 pounds and he's tanked, don't bring him tools. <laughs> what the guy wanted a jackhammer? <laughs> but Andre, Andre, uh, he, he was... He was hard to travel with sometimes because he didn't like people. He was tired of people asking him how big he was, how much he weighed, how big his hands were. He was just tired of that. And he knew he was, he knew he was dying. Yeah. Let's go to uh, Tim in Texas. Tim, what's up? Hello? Hey there. Um, yeah, I just uh, uh, just wanted to say to Bobby that uh, the greatest match I ever saw was that Royal Rumble with uh, Ric Flair winning. And I just wanted to, uh, I always wanted to say you did the greatest selling job I've ever seen of every, of, uh, any wrestling match I've ever seen. And, thank you very uh, much. That's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to thank you for the, one of the best lines in wrestling. We're not the kind of guys to say we told you so, but we told you so. I thought that was the most entertaining match I've ever seen. I just wanted to say thanks. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Tony in Connecticut. Tony. Yeah, hi. Uh, I had a quick question for Bobby. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, are you doing any uh, further projects with the WOW promotion at all? With WOW? Yeah. Uh, I may do the April 8th pay-per-view. I'm not sure yet. Well, I, I had uh, two quick questions about it. Uh, sure. A, um, are you Canadian? Of, in your opinion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. In your opinion, um, there's... The WOW promotion of today bear any similarities to uh, the Rock and Wrestling Connection 1985 WWF as far as gimmicks and characters and all that. I don't understand the question. The Rock and Roll. Well, no, I mean. Oh, he's like like he's trying to compare it to like say 1985 WWF. Well, yeah. you can't compare it because it's all women. Yeah. And, and well, it's, no, it's... I, I just meant as far as the uh, story, the gimmicks and. Uh, Characters and the flashy uh, storylines. Oh well, yeah, it compares to it compares to 2001 right now. Everything going on with the spandex and the pans and the beautiful ladies and the pyro and the lights and everything. Yeah, it's it, it's the same, but it's just women compared to men. And also, um, I was wondering, would you ever consider uh, getting into managing again with the Wow promotion? No, I will never manage again. Oh no. No. Well, you were the one one of the greatest. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I was five years old. I thought you were one of the greatest. That was my dad. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bo Bo Bobby. Hold on. i got a plane coming over. You hear it? <laughs> yeah, I can hear it. Uh, I'm talking to you guys from downtown Beirut. <laughs> I'm going to start managing Arafat. <laughs> How can you not shave in 25 years? <laughs> and have no beard but stubble. <laughs> and it looks like he's wearing a tablecloth from Steak and Shake. <laughs> oh, God. Bo Bobby, when you were a kid growing up, was, were there any managers, or whether it be Red Berry or somebody like that, that you, I, like, when you, did you, you know, like, idolize and go, yes. oh, this is like, like who you pattern yourself after? Bobby Davis. Bobby Davis? Yep. Yeah. Bobby Davis is a friend of mine. I had a privilege of meeting Bobby Davis and, uh, Getting to know him, and him and I broadcast a match once uh, on uh, I think it was Superstars or Challenge for Vince, and uh, he lives in uh, Bakersfield. He has about ten Wendy's. So he's doing pretty good. 
Who was? I think we probably lost Brian. We got an idea during the break. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you guys think of it, but I think we figured out a way to save uh, Vince on Saturday night. Celebrity XFL. No, no one likes that no, one. Nobody bit. Nobody did. Nothing. Okay, bad idea. Okay, Brian, save him then. You never even watched the football game yet. That's why I didn't get the joke. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Let's go to Mike in Connecticut. Or Mark in Connecticut, sorry. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, hey we're doing um, great. No slight to Frank. My question's for Bobby, though. Um, Everyone's question's for Bobby. Frank's I, okay with he's it. He's Bobby. Okay. <laughs> Bobby, um, two things. First of all, um, I seem to remember you did a sit-down interview with Costas in 89 on the later show. And um, just help me out here. I believe it was Gene Mock that referred to you as the smartest man in all sports. Or was it John Madden? Madden. Madden, okay. I was on the... Uh, 88 Madden team. There you go. That was uh, quite a title and well deserved, I might add. Well, it was uh, it was really nice. It, they, he sent me a nice plaque that weighed about 40 pounds, <laughs> and uh, I got sweatsuits and everything. And you know, I got to meet him one day. I was in Philadelphia, and I see his bus. Oh yeah, he, had, he goes all over on that bus. Yeah. So I, 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 said, I said Madden cruises. So I'm, I'm standing outside the Marriott. So I walked over to it, and there's a garden front. I said, Is John Madden in there? He said, Yeah. I said, I'd like to meet him. I said, I'm Bobby Heenan, could you tell him that? So he goes in, he says, come on in. So you go in, and Madden's got about ten TVs in there. <laughs> He's got peanut butter and jelly jars all open with forks in it and stuff. <laughs> There's socks all over the place. It looks like the Y. Oh, my but what a nice guy, and he's, he's a big guy. Oh, that's he's, awesome. He's got big paws and everything. We talked for about ten minutes, and I said, I don't want to bother you anymore. I'll leave, but uh, what a gentleman. Oh, that's totally awesome. Um, just a question for you, okay? It's hypothetical, because I think, um, given the opportunity, you would have been one of the best bookers as far as making money there ever was in the business. So uh, with that in mind, hypothetically, Flair's uh, tenure in the WWF in 91, okay? You have complete control. How do you book that run for the world title against Hogan? Differently, I should, than it was done. Would you would you put Flair over Hogan for the title? Uh, well, first of all, I never wanted to be a promoter or booker because handling a bunch of guys is like running a nightcare center, <laughs> and I don't want to do that. I know how to get me over. I don't want to ha think about how to get fifty guys over. Yeah. So I don't be bothered with that. Um, but I would put Hogan, uh, Flair over Hogan at WCW. I mean, Pardon, WWF, yeah. Would you think that would have made money to put Flair over in the beginning and then have Hogan do the chase or? Uh, yeah, I think Hogan at that time would have been better off chasing than standing back. Okay, that's cool. Well, uh, I'll let some others get on. Thanks for my, uh, taking my calls. Good luck, Bobby. Thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, we got an email for Frank. Um, Frank, you talk, talk to Pride at all about fighting? I know you have, actually. Yeah, I've actually had him like three or four times. Then I have this other attorney who's brokering with them or whatever. Uh, but there's not a lot of interest in it. I, they keep telling me that I'm not a big enough name, that my weight's, my name's not gonna, you know, fill a dome or whatever to fight Sakuraba. So I think that they, they just kinda wanna use me as a stepping stone, they're looking more towards Hickson, but they don't wanna pay me anything. So, you know, whatever. Yeah. What about other, what, what, what organizations are you, you know, you're talking to UFC? Who, who else? Uh, talking to the UFC, they're, they're, they really want me to fight Tito. Uh, K1 wants me to fight in the K1. Uh, they want me to fight not only no rules, but they also want me to fight K1 style. Which... Well, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Because that's kind of out of your element in a lot of ways. It is. It's not my game. And, uh, you know, I honestly don't believe that I can compete at a, at a high professional level. But, you know, I kick ass and I'm good at what I do. And uh, if, if I get somebody who who would match well with me, I'd kickbox with them. You know, it's not, uh, it's not any different. A sport is a sport is a sport. Kickboxing just hurts a little more. That's all. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's go back to uh, Bobby. Um, Bobby, you know, when you uh, made the move to WCW, um, what were your thoughts at that point in your career? Um, the WWF thing was pretty much over, and were you excited about going into WCW, or was it one of those things where when you went in, it was kind of like uh, it was just the job that came? Well, when I left WWF, my daughter had um, was going to was going to University of Alabama, and I was just so tired of traveling. And I wanted to be I live in Florida, and I wanted to be closer and be more at home. And I had been on the road for so many. I got two million miles just on Delta, and that's the last thing I want to do is win a free trip. <laughs> so uh, I was just I was just tired, and I, I needed a break. And there was no heat with Vince and I. We left uh, cordially, and no problem there at all. But when I got 
I, I was going to go to Hollywood for a while. I was going to see if I could get uh, do commercials or get an agent and do something like that. And then uh, Bischoff called and gave me an offer, so I took it. Because it wasn't going to be every day, and I could be in Atlanta, which was a two-and-a-half-hour drive to Tuscaloosa. So that's What's why I it? took it. Now, uh, what were your thoughts going back for, for a very brief period on USA Network? They did the Bobby Heenan show. Um, wasn't all that long. What, you know, looking back, good, good pluses and minuses of that show. Doing that show. Oh, that was great doing that show because uh, Vince produced it and he brought all the oddballs on for me, and it was just really fun to do. I, I what, enjoyed doing it. Whatever happened to the Rosatis? Uh, I and understand. Who were the Rosatis? They were fans, I always right? ask that question. Well, they were fans to... from. They were fans from upstate New York, right? They were, they were fans from Poughkeepsie, yeah. and they were friends of Vince's, and, and Vince liked them. And he'd give them tickets all the time, and they came by, and be, they were they were great fans, and I had a great fun with them. Well, I guess one of them has passed uh, away. Uh, one of the Rosatis has passed away. I'm not sure which one, but yeah. they, they were really nice ladies. Mm -hmm. What were some of your favorite Gorilla Monsoon stories? Because you guys worked together forever, had some awesome vign vignettes on uh, the primetime wrestling show, and. We would, we, would go to, we would stand in the corner at 42nd and Broadway. We were going down to Carnegie Dow at 57th Street to eat. So there'd be a cop stand there. So I'd say, we could tell he recognized us. So Monsoon would say, we got to go down here. I said, why don't we go up here? He said, because we have to go down here. I said, but I want to go up here. The light would change. We'd both walk in different directions. <laughs> and the cop turned to the other guy. He says, they're both screwed up. <laughs> You really, you, I mean, one of the things I, when, when you guys did that show and you would do that biplane and everything like that, you you um, you really liked him. He was one of your best friends in wrestling, wasn't he? Who? Uh, Monsoon. Oh, yes. Yes, he was my, uh, not in wrestling, he was my best, one of my best friends in life. What, uh, now, what, what, what else? I mean, you mentioned uh, Bastine, Lanza. Von Raschke. Von Raschke. How, how did you and Bachwinkle get along outside the ring? No problem. Mm -hmm. Nick, Nick, just don't talk to him. He'll, you don't have much time in life to have Nick talk to you. <laughs> you ask Nick what time it is, he tells you how to build a watch. <laughs> was he the favorite guy, your favorite guy to manage, or was Flair or Lance Stevens. or Stevens? Stevens. Stevens, Lanza, and Bobby Duncan. Any, re any reason why uh, those guys above the other guys? Uh, they were more my personality. I'll tell you a guy I managed who never got a whole lot of recognition and was one of the best talents I've ever seen in the business was Bob Orton Jr. Mm -hmm. He was excellent. I had no pro I never had a problem managing anybody. I never had uh, any. And Paul Orndorff, Paul was great. Paul was a little tense and tight all the time because he he wanted to get over so bad and he wanted to make all that money. But what a because he it came from football and so he's got that mentality. And but Paul was I never had a problem with anybody, I, except the Valiants. Really? Yeah, they were just uh, white trash. Mm -hmm. Really, they conned everybody. They wouldn't pay for a ride. They snuck in the hotel rooms. Just. Just low class people I don't want to be around. Did you have any promoters? What, what, what promoter would you say was the worst one you ever worked for? Nick Gruff. Everyone says that. Because everybody worked for him. Because <laughs> he was bad. <laughs> Got any stories about Nick? I met him one time in Nashville, Tennessee. I can't tell you the story because it's vulgar. <laughs> no, no, really. It's, 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 it's really demeaning. It's, 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 a, it's a real bad story. He, he, he came in the dressing room and he made one of the boys, a young guy, stand on a chair and tell everybody um, different aspects of his life with other women and stuff. And He, he, he just was a horrible man. And, and the, the place would be full. You'd ask him how big the house. He said, well, those people got big coats on and there were a lot of fat women over here. And I gave this side out to the veterans. <laughs> so he was just a, a Tennessee uh, hillbilly. Mm -hmm. Best promoter is probably Paul Bosch. Paid the best. Mm -hmm. Paul well, Bosch paid the best. You worked with him with Bachwinkle a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what about um, as far as far as uh, I mean, actually, I would say wouldn't wouldn't Vince pay the best? Or are you just talking about he paid on a percentage of the best? Uh, well, see, Paul was only a Friday night town, yeah. so you just went in there once uh, every three weeks on a Friday, and for that one shot, he paid the best. Vince probably paid the best because he had more people in there, and he was in bigger buildings than the Houston Coliseum. When you, uh, how was the bruiser? He was, he was, a, he was one of the worst human beings I've ever been around in my life. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I say that because it's not, and it's not funny. Um, okay. th 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 this is a personal thing, and I don't really want to get into that. 
because you know you were, in, in the ring he was he was he, in the ring he was he was beautiful. Yeah, I mean, because because I mean, like as as a kid, I mean, the one thing that I always remember was uh, Dick the Bruiser against you know Bi Black Jack Lanza, and you were always bloody in every magazine corner. This is like early seventies. Yeah, it was like that was the guy that. Uh, you know, I mean, that was the big, the big. I mean, that was probably the big program that you worked before. You know, before Bachwinkle and Stevens, I guess. Oh yeah, Kirby Puckett told me him and his, from Chicago, and Kirby said him and his brother used to sneak in the amphitheater just to see dudes who crack me open. Yeah. And welcome to the Hall of Fame, Kirby. <laughs> How was Do you have a lot of memorabilia? Pardon? As far as like old magazines and old videotapes and stuff like that. Do I have any? Yeah. Yeah, I have you know all my sequin jackets and even the suit I wore at WrestleMania and a lot of things I have. I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, getting rid of that and selling it because I two reasons. One, I I got my memories in my head and I don't want to carry all that stuff and pack it away and not ever see it anymore or use it. And one, I want to make money off it. Yeah. Remember this: respect is for the dead, cash is for the living. <laughs> What's uh? What were your thoughts on Crusher? Working with Crusher. Good guy. Good guy. Mm -hmm. He's uh he's in Milwaukee. He just had a. Uh, a little heart problem, a big heart problem. They replaced four uh, valves and everything, but he, he's doing all right. He's a good guy. Anyone that you, you know, we were talking about. Is there, is there anyone that you, I don't, I mean, as far as like as an athlete or something like that, we're like in awe of, like watching them going, like you know, I don't, I, I, mean, I don't know, like whether it's a modern guy or a guy from your childhood. They were, an athlete. You know, in in the ring, you know, that could do things in the ring. What you know, like that, I don't know, that nobody else could do, and you just go, how could he physically do that? Um, wow. Uh, the Mexican guys, I can't believe what they do. Or why? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't understand all those moves, and I, we never did that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the guys in the, in the ring, I, I like guys that were stunned. I like Johnny Valentine. I like Gene Kaninsky. I like guys that, I, I like, one of the best matches I've ever seen, and everybody probably will agree with me, it was Dory Funk against Jack Briscoe. Yeah, everyone talks about their so matches. Those were great matches. Of them. Yeah. Great matches. Very serious matches. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What's, what, what about what's Shawn Michaels? Because you were there when he was, like, on the rise. Did you see him as a guy that someday would be, like, a top star? Did you just see him and go, you know, this guy is awesome, but he's small? That's right. Uh, he, he, he was a very talented man, and he, uh, he could do things in that ring, and he, he was like a young Ray Stevens. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, he wasn't like, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, Stevens, when he worked, he was 230, and most guys are, you know, I started a 250 pound guy with a huge guy, now you got 300 pound kids playing high school football. So it's a lot different now, the way life is. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the whole, the whole thing, like in the old days, I mean, if you had a guy who was 6'4", 270, he could be a main eventer, even, you know, just on that size, and now, sure. and you've got, now you have to have the physique, you've got to have a lot of agility, because nobody wants to see a big lumbering guy anymore. You know, like John Studd was probably one of the nicest human beings on this earth. He was really a gentleman. But you'd look on the paper, you'd see the giant against John Studd. Oh, my God. Two huge guys. i got to go see this. But Studd, Studd couldn't take bumps, and they wanted to see Andre do giant things. Slam him across that ring. Press slam him. Do that. And John wasn't capable of doing that, so when the match went on, they farted at it. Yeah, I remember a lot of Andre the Giant John Studd matches. Yeah. But, but you see what I mean? It, People paid to see the giant do giant things, and he couldn't do them with John. Yeah. What's uh, what, what did you think when you first? Because actually, you probably first ran across Andre in early seventies with Vern, right? Uh, I met Andre in Japan. Uh, oh, even earlier than that. Yeah, and he was in Montreal working for uh, Grand Prix, that was owned by Vachans and Carpentier and Dino Bravo. And that's when I first met him. And he was about six eight. 400 pounds, and in two weeks he was seven feet tall and 500. <laughs> I remember that. I remember a story. He was making love to a girl in the room one night. And remember the Sheik Adnan El? Of course, Adnan Casey. He thought. I said, "What does it look like?" Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. He says it looks like a lion raping a rat. <laughs> We're, we're breaking up right now. I don't know where. Actually, actually, Bobby still there? I hear something ticking. Yeah, we hear something ticking. I think they're about to try to get us before uh, we go to the show. Um, <laughs> it says they're ticking this. I like root comment. Yeah, Pardon? that's about it. Yeah, the, the Ar Arafat's coming to get you for that comment. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> we are actually totally out of time, uh, Bobby. I want to thank you. This was a really entertaining show, Frank. 
want to thank you, of course, and uh, good luck doing the announcing tonight. Thank you. And, and Frank, uh, can you hear me, Frank? I can. I apologize for, uh, I didn't mean disrespect to your brother. I just didn't see him wrestle that much, but I wish the best for both of you guys. Oh, I thank you, Bobby, and you were always one of my favorites, and my brother wasn't, so don't worry. <laughs> So just put me in the well. <laughs> hey, Frank, so Frank, what are you up to? The seven hundred eighty million dollars right now? Yeah, I'm, I, uh, I've actually gone over uh, the billion dollar mark and so no you longer shows. Yeah, you and Vince are head to head. I may start the uh, PFL or something. <laughs> David, yes. Look for me at www.bobbythebrain.com. Okay, cool. I'm going to be. Uh, Available to do personal appearances, opening at malls, uh, bar mitzvahs. Uh, I'll tie people's skates together. Whatever you want. Okay, cool. And Bobby, we would really love to have you back. This was was this is one of my favorite shows. Dude, when we go off the air, can I talk to your producer? You, I'll give you my new number because I, I'm changing. Yeah, yeah. Hold, hold on, yeah. You can... Actually, you know what? Just uh, probably because I'm actually with Dave here in Atlantic City. Uh, I'll give you a ring uh, early next week, and we'll set something up. Super. Excellent. Okay. okay. We gotta head. We gotta head out of here, Brian. I want to thank you for this week, and of course, uh, we will be back on Monday at five. David, remember the drinks are in the house, and the highballs are on the giraffe. <laughs>